This episode is brought to you by Wear Buff, your go-to for Buffalo-inspired apparel. Get your hands on stylish t-shirts, hoodies, and more at wearbuff.com. That's W-E-A-R-B-U-F dot com. And make sure you use the promo code TWB at checkout for 10% off your first order. Stay Buffalo proud with Wear Buff. The Buffalo Bills make a series of roster moves and the reasons why I think they will win the Super Bowl in 2025, this week on the Wandering Buffalo Podcast. You're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo Podcast with your host, Justin Goddard. Bills Mafia, welcome in, and thank you for joining me on another episode of the Wandering Buffalo Podcast, a show on the Buffalo Fanbase Podcast Network. My name is Justin, and I will be your host today, and I think a pretty fun show lined up today. First, we want to talk a little bit about what's been going on in training camp. Um, As I've mentioned in previous shows, um, I was able to take in a practice last week. Um, Wasn't able to get any more tickets to go be able to get my own eyeballs on this, Um, so leaning pretty heavily on... Some of the media, some of the other content creators in this space. Um, big one for me is Joe Marino of Locked On Bills. Um, if you listen to this show, you probably already know Joe Marino. Um, one of the best in the game, super detailed, and he's been able to um, be going to multiple practices. I think he's done three so far and has another couple. Um, so on the field access, you know, just very detailed. He's very thorough in his plan. Um, so for more of a, you know, play by play, you know, notable plays, things that are going on during the camp. Um, one of my go-to sources, um, like I said, one of the best in the bills content creating space. Um, so Free plug for Locked On Bills there, but it's honestly one of my favorite shows. I listen to it just about every day, Um, and if I miss some days, I catch up on it. So um, leaning heavily into, you know, some of his observations um, for kind of the first part of what I want to talk about. I'm going to do a second segment today and just reasons why I think the Bills can win the Super Bowl this year. Um, and I, I think there's plenty to work with there and have a little fun with it. Um, right off the top, some, some transactions this week, um, actually just announced right before I started recording, um, was the signing of Terrell Burgess. We also saw the signing of Kareem Jackson and kind of the corresponding move there was Jake Browning has been released. So... Plenty of intrigue here for me. Um, first of all, with Jake Brown, Jack Browning being released, kind of signals the end of the punter battle between he and Sam Martin. And I thought there was a chance that he was going to win this battle, uh, especially with some of the inconsistencies with Sam Martin down the stretch last year. Um, you know, it's still early in camp. I think the signing of these two safeties gives me a little pause on some of the injuries that um, that we're dealing with at the safety position. But there's a lot of training camp left. Some of these guys could come healthy again. And, you know, somebody you brought in as like a camp body ends up getting cut. We bring Browning back, something like that, whatever. We'll see what happens there. Um, but for me, the signing of Kareem Jackson and Terrell Burgess we see the Bills have been dealing with injuries at the safety position, which is concerning for me. Spot where we're obviously moving on from Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. Again, Micah Hyde has never fully retired. It's said that if he plays again, it'll be with the Bills. Maybe he doesn't want to do a training camp. Maybe he's just relaxing for a little bit. Um, 
I think this opens the door for that possibility a little bit more. But in the, at least in the interim, uh, we have the signing of these two guys, and that comes on the heels of dealing with injuries for Cole Bishop and Mike Edwards. Um, now Mike Edwards had already been, you know, working back from an injury. Now dealing with a hamstring, Cole Bishop was seen with his arm heavily wrapped after practice. This kind of signals to me that those injuries are a little bit more severe um, than you'd like to see at this time of the year. I know McDermott has said uh, Mike Edwards is week to week, and McDermott is usually pretty spot on with you know how he how he gives timelines for injuries. So week to week likely means out most of the preseason. We'll see what happens. Um, and even at that, that was you know a veteran guy coming over, but still learning a new system, all those things. And I had him penciled in to be the starter week one um, through this whole competition. Uh, Some. Not not what we wanted to see. Um, Cole Bishop, these reps are super valuable for a rookie coming in. Um, so tough to see an injury there. I didn't really think that he was going to be, you know, a week one starter anyways. But I did feel like there was going to be packages that would kind of feature him. So we'll see what happens there. A couple of veterans added. Um, at least for the time being. Um, Another note on practice, we did have Alec Anderson leave and go to the hospital uh, for heat-related sickness. So hoping, you know, all the best for him. I did read just before doing the show today that uh, McDermott and Bean were able to get on the phone with him while he was at the hospital Said he was in good spirits, so hopefully nothing more serious going on there. But it's hot out there, and, you know, these guys got to make sure they're staying hydrated and all that. So hopefully it's, you know, a quick turnaround, uh, and we'll see what happens there. And then kind of on the other side of the coin, more off the field, um, we did see uh, Kim, Kim Pagula make an appearance at practices and even broke down the huddle with Josh Allen um, at the end of practice and just super good to see him out there, um, you know, moving around. We haven't seen a ton from her, you know, since her health incident and just, just seeing her able to move around and, be out there with the guys it, it's super encouraging we'll see you know where the progress goes from here but um from something that was kept very private which fully respect understand that all that just getting a little glimpse at you know her doing a little bit better um took a little bit of a load off the mind for me at least um Moving into some of the players that have been kind of standing out in a good way or a bad way. Um, And I want to start with Marcus Valdez-Scantling. And he's a player that was added this offseason, got a fully guaranteed contract. He has void years on his contract that, you know, you would assume if this kind of one-year deal went well, those could be turned into real contract years. And it it kind of seemed like there was a bit of a long-term plan here. And of everything I've listened to, seen, read, I'm hearing next to nothing about MDS. And, you know, this is with Chase Claypool's out with an injury. Also somebody you weren't hearing a ton about. Um, a lot of new faces in the room, a lot of people getting opportunities and being a veteran coming in, I was expecting to see, you know, more on like the front front end of things with MVS and maybe 
kind of fizzle out a little bit towards the tail end of camp. But I've seen next to nothing about him making plays and whatnot. On the other side of the coin, seen a ton of Tyrell, Tyrell Shavers uh, working in with the ones and the twos, making plays, glowing reviews from McDermott. And if Tyrell Shavers were to make this roster, I think it would be, you know, over Chase Claypool, Marcus Velda Scantling. Um, and that's kind of even getting into if the Bills keep six receivers. Last year it was only five. Some some tough sledding there. I think the first four are absolutely locked in and Curtis Samuel, Khalil Shakir, Keon Coleman, and Matt Collins. I I think that's an absolute lock. And then you just have a long list of guys fighting for one, maybe two spots. And the name that I'm hearing pop the most is Tyrell Shavers. Uh, And then you look a little bit further down at KJ Hamler and Andy Isabella and all these guys that can also contribute on special teams, which is huge when you're talking about the tail end of of the depth chart here, right? MVS, Chase Claypool, don't have a huge history of special teams work. So while I I think that the fully guaranteed contract for MVS kind of swings the pendulum a little bit, we've also seen Brandon Bean being very willing to, you know, eat some humble pie, move on from a mistake very quickly. Um, I always think about Kelvin Benjamin for this. You know, he was a pretty big name addition when he was brought in and obviously went very poorly. It only lasted about a half a season and being cut bait. It it wasn't working. He admitted his mistake and moved on. Um, So when we're talking about in a training camp situation, the guy that you brought in to be some sort of difference maker, a guy that can take the top off the defense. We'll see what happens. Uh, Again, there's there's all the preseason to play. There's still training camp. There's a lot of time for things to change. But as of right now, not looking super great for MVS. Even Chase Claypool and Tyrell Shavers is somebody whose stock is rising. I want to talk a little bit about Von Miller. I have all kinds of cautious optimism for him coming back this year, and he's looked good through training camp, but he looks like Von Miller, and I don't think, you know, with his age, with the injuries that he's had, I I don't think we ever see, you know, prime Von Miller again. That's just unrealistic. But even... If we get 80% of who he was when he came to Buffalo, uh, that player was every bit the player that Bean decided we needed, and he was filling the role. He was, you know, getting clutch pressures and sacks. He was, you know, making plays late in the game. It He was kind of that difference maker that we needed, and then, you know, he gets hurt before the playoffs, and our pass rush is non-existent in the playoffs and y'all know the story from there. I think that what I've seen from him so far, it looks like he's, you know, coming back nicely from that injury. He's since said, you know, some weird things that he probably shouldn't have been playing at all last year. At I don't even want to get too far into that because this is the same guy that said he'd be ready to go week one. It felt rushed back when he was back by week five. There was unrealistic timelines going on all over the place. And then, you know, it seems like he was the one kind of pressing to play faster. And then he comes and says he shouldn't have played it all last year. All very confusing. Don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. The important thing is Von Miller's looking good. And... 
in a room where we rotate a lot of defensive linemen to start with anyways, uh, I think there's a world where you you have Groot and Epinesa as your primary starters, and you're able to use Von Miller more as like a pass rush pass rush specialist. And we've seen we've seen players excel in that kind of role. Leonard Floyd, you know, having all kinds of sacks with his lowest percent usage, I, I believe, is for his entire career. Uh, so if you can have that guy almost playing like as your six man and just coming in long and late downs, I think I think that could be like the best version of Von Miller that you get at this point. Um, so super excited for that. It it does come with the caveat that he's willingly taken a pay cut for this season, which is huge. You know, you need your players with the huge contracts to to be performing at that level. Um, otherwise, you're in trouble real quick. So him kind of betting on himself, he, there's all kinds of incentives in his contract. Uh, but, you know, taking fully guaranteed money and reworking it for the team, there is absolutely no reason he had to do that. Um, so, you know, looking at him as you know, more middle of the pack defensive end, I, I think he can outperform that contract and earn a ton of these incentives really easy. It's a it's a player motivated by earning money. He's chasing some historic players on the all time sacks list. He knows where he stands. He knows he's getting towards the tail end of the career here. We'll see what happens. It's still an, an older player coming back from serious injuries, but I got a, I got a feeling there. Uh, on the offensive side of the ball, got to touch on Keon Coleman, and obviously a player, if you listen to the show, wasn't somebody I was super high on. He looks He looks great during camp, and we'll see what happens when the live action starts and defenses start you know scheming you see a lot of you know really vanilla stuff throughout the off season but for what I've seen he's been winning at all levels of the field he's got kind of like this instant chemistry with Allen um, we mentioned Kelvin Benjamin earlier I remember when Josh Allen was you know I believe it was pregame he was went up to Benjamin he was like hey you want to run some routes and Benjamin was like nope the exact opposite with Keon Coleman. He's doing the extra work with Josh Allen. They have chemistry going on. And more than anything, like I, I personally just need this kid to be great. He's so entertaining of a personality. We're already seeing him, you know, giving back to the fans. Just already a fan favorite, and he hasn't played one regular season snap. So I'm more encouraged having watched him working with the team and coming in, just the attitude he's had towards it, all that. Uh, he's doing all the right things. If that translates to a pretty good football player, he is going to be beloved by Bill's Mafia forever. Um, so excited for him and honestly excited for this this wide receiver core to start with. Uh, Khalil Shakir became one of my favorite players last year. I expect more of the same from him. Curtis Samuel has he's looked good throughout training camp so far, developing that chemistry with Allen. It almost reminds me of like a, like a better version of Emmanuel Sanders, who like not saying anything against Emmanuel Sanders. We got him later in his career. He was still very impactful here. Curtis Samuel is still pretty young. I believe he's 27, and he has just played with a list of not good quarterbacks. I'm so excited to see what him and Allen are able to do together. And then rounding out the top four, Matt Collins, who I've talked about a little bit in the past of how I 
expected him to be like uh, an upgraded Sherfield of like being able to do some things on offense, but like special teams captain leader there, he's going to be great on special teams and whatever you get on offense is a bonus. Watching him work through training camp, reading, listening to other people talk about it, he's making plays and I don't think it's going to be a guy that gets like 80 receptions for the season, something like that. But he's going to factor into this offense and he's shown like his long speed. He's shown some ability to be like an underneath possession receiver. Very excited for Mac Collins for being kind of like a, a depth receiver on this team. Very excited to see what happens there. Um, it's about it for the offensive side of the ball. Some of the um, observations, some of the things I've been following. One last person I want to mention on the defensive side of the ball is Gable Steveson. And a player that I have absolutely zero expectations for, obviously a phenomenal athlete, being, you know, an Olympic wrestler. Translating that to the football field, I was, you know, a guy that's never played before versus, you know, all these athletes that have played their entire lives. Um, but I've I've been seeing some things of him winning some one-on-one reps, you know, making some noise. There was tackle for loss. And this was a real low risk high reward type of signing if he ends up getting cut and nothing comes of it it it's it's really no big deal if he's able to come in and pick up the position and use that athleticism at you know a spot defensive tackle where to be honest we've been struggling with depth for years i think there's a chance that he could make some noise and What I like about that signing is he's brought in at a position that you don't have to be the most nuanced football mind to play defensive tackle, especially if we're talking about, you know, a third and long and you come in for a pass pass rush rep and it's just, hey, go beat the guy in front of you. There is some more complex stuff with, you know, rush plans and stunts and all that kinds of stuff. But seeing him in camp, having, you know, one-on-ones where he's able to beat the guy across from him, it, it's encouraging at this stage in the game. So we'll we'll see what happens there. Definitely somebody I'm keeping an eye on. Um, stick around. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, teased it earlier, just want to give some reasons where I think the Bills can win the Super Bowl in 2025. Hey, this is Dick DeGroat, Bills dad. Now back to the show. 